Good afternoon. Mike McCormick's presentation probably brought tears to your eyes. I was quite excited. Seven years of a drought, and we're only year two of heaven? That was great. That was great. All right. So first of all, within the offshore service vessels, not all companies are the same, and, and your three companies are different. So why don't you each spend a couple minutes talking about what, what, what makes your company different? Okay, well, we're the same in a lot of ways, uh, but Tidewater is more focused internationally. So our largest operations are in West Africa and the North Sea, but we also have operations in the Middle East and Asia, as well as in Brazil and the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. We're primarily focused on the PSV market, but we also have a large anchor handling group as well. All right, Hornbeck Offshore mainly is in the Western Hemisphere. Primarily, our largest market, of course, is the U.S. We're the largest uh, operator of the high-end, ultra-high-spec uh, OSVs here. We also have a division with our specialty division that, um, that has subsea construction vessels, flotels. Another arm to our company is our military franchise, which is growing quite a bit. And our wind uh, influence uh, in the, on the East Coast today, we're, we're looking at a lot of wind projects. We have several vessels working there. But our focus is to stay in, in the seven countries we are, and just in the Western Hemisphere, and grow those markets. And John. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having us, uh, listening to us again. Uh, I guess how we're different, we have, we're roughly half domestic, half international. Uh, domestically, our main asset class are lift boats, which are self-propelled, self-elevating work platforms, uh, which actually are working, two of them are working on wind projects this summer off the East Coast. And we have worked last year on wind, so they are uh, renewable focused. Uh, and within the international market, uh, key markets are Guyana, West Africa, and the Middle East. So why don't we talk about what's going on in the market currently? Let's talk about the drop in oil prices in the last 12 months. Has that impacted the market? Has it impacted the market less than you expected? But let's talk about what's going on in the market. Well, I'll start and let these guys follow on. You know, the interesting thing about the most recent pullback, you know, both the instability in the regional banking market as well as the pullback in an oil price, is that it hasn't had an impact on our activity levels. Throughout the past seven years, any time there was any uh, turbulence in the markets, whether it was the macro or the oil market specifically, I would have customers coming to me and renegotiating contracts or delaying tenders pushing out delivery dates, none of that has happened. In fact, I've seen just the opposite. You know, there are still a real air of scarcity uh, in vessels out there. So, you know, you know, day rates are continuing to move up. You know, we, we moved them up another, you know, $1,600 in, in Q1. Uh, you know, our leading edge day rates are continuing to increase. So I, I certainly appreciate the, the macro backdrop, but from our perspective, especially throughout the international markets, there has been no pullback in activity and certainly no pullback in the acceleration of day rates. I would agree with that. Um, what we're seeing on the ground is quite different than the macro of what you hear in the news every day. Uh, there's a lot of fears of the economy and a, and a drop and all these things and, and a drop in the commodity price, but the actions on the ground, uh, we're seeing more and more long-term contracts. We're seeing more and more demand coming. And for the first time in my history in this business, which is over 32 years, uh, the first time the oil companies have had other demand and pull on the equipment. The wind industry is pulling our equipment because it's easy adaptable to, to wind um, at a cheaper cost. Uh, and uh, our military, uh, not just here, the military is here, but all around the globe are finding out our type of equipment is very conducive to their operations uh, for so small scale uh, military vessels, so vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the new bill price. And I think the new bill price is a governor as well, uh, that we just can't go out and, and build new vessels because of the price. And let's face it, uh, the cost of capital is through the roof, so nobody really wants to do that and take this type of risk. So I don't see any new bills happening, uh, maybe some spot here and there, but uh, exactly right. The demand uh, picture is quite different on the ground than what you hear in the news. And John, in your business, you've got wind as a growing component. Take us through. Yeah, well, before I get to wind, I guess I just caution, having lived through the last six, seven years, I'd say yet. <laughs> haven't had any uh, renegotiations. Um, 
Yeah, I agree. The picture overall is favorable, and, and wind is certainly a growing industry, uh, and we're starting to see, particularly in the U.S., you know, projects that have been talked about for a long time and delayed, you know, by years uh, coming to fruition. And I think what's interesting, at least in our, biz our part of the wind, is it's not even the installation work, it's all the pre-work before the installation. So it's accommodation, uh, trenching for the export cable, it's, it's, you know, ancillary services to the big wind installation, which is still yet to come. So it's nice that we're seeing this activity even in advance of turbines and foundations being, being laid. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're cautiously optimistic. And Todd, getting back to you for a second, that military business sets you aside from, from many of your peers. Take a, take a minute and, and help the audience understand that, that business. Well, you know, it's commonly in the, in the news today that our, the U.S. Navy's fleet has diminished and deteriorated, to, and we haven't put the capital back in as a country into that space. The money's gotten moved around uh, to the other areas. Um, and so they're really going to lean on the merchant marine and, and vessels like ours to accomplish some goals. And if you just look out the window, there's a lot of threats today that we didn't have, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, the China threat, the, what Russia's doing, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in, in the Middle East with China and Iraq and Iran and everywhere else. So um, it's uh, in Saudi. So I think it's, it's building up a combination where... Uh, these these threats are a naval response, uh, and there's just not enough uh, vessels on the water from the Navy today, so they've got to go to industry to try to bolster their their uh, position to, to deal with those threats. Just want to add, Jim, we, we do have a small uh, management business for the uh, Navy, actually. We had two boats, we sold them, uh, aluminum hull vessels. I can't say too much because I don't have security clearance. Uh, but we are working for them and, and manage them since we sold about three years ago. And Quinton, you've done a little consolidating in your time, but you probably still view this market as being largely fragmented. You know, I know there's a limit to what you can say in terms of forward statements, but tell us what you can. Oh, don't worry about it. Just say it. Yeah. You got two of your candidates here. <laughs> you know, listen, I've been really happy with the consolidation we've been able to, to accomplish in the past five years. You know, we did Gulfmark, we did Swire, and we're about to complete the Solstead acquisition. In fact, we launched a bond offering last night for that. So I'm really excited about those elements of the business. And there are a few more pieces that we, that we can add easily. But it's a highly fragmented industry. It's naturally defragmented. You can try and consolidate it, but you're not going to lock anything up for too long. So you really got to get the right vessel classes uh, and, and the right geographies established. And I feel that we've got a real good lock on the on the Eastern Hemisphere and the near Western Hemisphere. In the, in, the, in the Americas, we're still a little bit light. And John, same question. Consolidation still to come? Too fragmented still? Overall, still too fragmented. There's you know too many, too much fragmentation overall. Quinton's done quite a good start, but there's still more to come. Uh, and I think you know, point Todd made. There's no new buildings, and you know the economics just aren't there for new buildings. So you know you have the existing fleet, and the existing fleets are, are too splintered, and it's not like somebody can go out and build and recreate fragmentation. So I think you know it lends itself, and I think with the improving business, uh, lends itself to, to more intelligent consolidation. And Todd, you've always got a view. Always have a view. <laughs> we don't charge enough, and we assume too much risk. Um, and I think that, you know, we all went through seven years of a downturn. We all lost a ton of money. I, I mean, personally, I lost a lot. All my equity holders lost a lot. So in Tidewater and all of our companies, the debt holders had to become equity holders and take haircuts. And, and I think that, you know, our client base all play, paid their dividends along the way. Uh, so, you know, now we're, we live in a new day. And if we don't do something about it to correct it, uh, that we're all in the same industry and we all have to make a fair amount of return on all of our capital, not just the equity capital, um, for these assets and then price for the risk that we assume. Because our companies exist because oil companies don't want to take the risk because they could own all the boat companies, they could own all the rig companies, uh, but they want to shove that risk somewhere else. So we have to, we, when I first got in the business, we priced for that risk, and we've got to get that back into the mantra. And I think the banks and the lending institutions and the equity holders need to demand that of the service companies, start pricing risk, 
and a fair rate of return and really understanding their contracts and just not signing any contracts uh, that the oil companies put in front of you. I've never been a big believer uh, in very long-term contracts at a real low day rate because when the market went down, they just renegotiated the contracts and they had all the leverage uh, to, to put you in a pinch. Uh, that's got to change. And I think it really becomes a community here that the lenders, the equity holders, and the companies in the supply chain need to reevaluate the way we assume risk and the way we price and get a fair return because our investors want a return of their capital as well and a dividend. Uh, so we've learned how the oil companies and our customers do it, and now it's our turn to do that as well. So let me stay with you for a second. What mistakes is the industry making right now? You can think about contracts as part of that issue. I do think uh, contracts are a big issue. Um, you know, if you go back, you know, to the supply time 89 type contracts or the 2005 international contracts uh, that were put out, uh, you know, those are fair uh, risk contracts, uh, knock for knock type contracts, but that's not what everybody's signing. Uh, they all, all want to win the job, so they're giving away a lot of the risk. And, and many times I see uh, there's a lot of young people in the industry now, a lot of people that don't have the history of where we are, how we got here today, and so they don't understand the risk that they're signing. And, uh, and they need to really understand when they assume that risk what it means to their company and what it means to real earnings because uh, it can put a day rate is just one element and if all you focus on a day rate and term and they give you a company gives you what its opex numbers are and that's how far as you look you're going to be a sore loser at the end of the day quinton same think, questions what what i was mistakes? just going to okay. add to that i mean i think you know it goes you're talking from the our company so the service side but it also goes from the customer side we have a lot of procurement people, most procurement people have never seen a market that wasn't in their favor. And so, you know, there's no, there's less planning ahead because they just assume they'll be ready to supply to meet whatever requirement they have and that they can dictate terms and, and dictate price to the service companies. And I think, you know, I wouldn't go as far as to say the shoe's on the other foot yet, but there's certainly there is a rebalancing and it's a re it'll be for them a re-education or, or an education. Well, the danger comes when day rates really go up and we forget what happened. And, 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 and money starts coming back in at a reasonable price. Because I guarantee you, you give us the opportunity, all these entrepreneurs, and you give them cheap money and access to it, we will overbuild it again. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me echo some of the things that I said and perhaps put it into context. Um, it, it is a, a low barrier to entry industry, so it's highly fragmented. And, and as we were coming out of the downturn in various regions, you, you saw a pattern repeat itself, which is it, the, people had gotten into almost a battered child syndrome where they would just take anything so that they could get utilization. And so, you know, the terms that got beaten down, whether it's substitute vessels or whether it's, you know, no mope fees or whatnot, some of those are coming back. But we, like Todd said, we have a long way to go to balance it out. And I think that we just need to stay focused on that as a consolidated competitor group to make sure that we're focused on doing the right thing for the industry, for the health of the industry. You know, the, the, the one thing that's helping us today is the fact that you know, people are now aware. There, there was a sticker shock phase in late late 21, even into early 22, uh, uh, from the oil companies to, to, and I think it really relates to what John was talking about, which is the fact that most of the people in the roles at the oil companies hadn't seen an upturn. So they didn't know what a fairly priced vessel it was. They don't know what a fairly priced contract is. So uh, everybody's been pushing back through, you know, throughout the last year, year and a half. But because it's a highly fragmented industry, it seems like every time you push day rates up six thousand dollars a day, somebody comes in at five thousand dollars a day, or you know, you give, you know, you ask for a mob, somebody doesn't ask for a mob. But all of that's changing as the, the 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 courage of the of the supplier group and the competitor group is is, is improving. But it's you know, unfortunately, going to take a little bit longer. Getting back to the market I, again, I think all of this is solved through more consolidation, though, in the right hands. Uh, because when you have it too fragmented, uh, you're exactly right. People are trying to, to win instead of really valuing the risk and the real returns. And, uh, and a lot of times the capital structures drive the decisions. 
uh, uh, on, how, on how they contract, and, and we need to get that right. That, that, I think that's one of the real important things is not having the capital structure, your debt capital or whatnot, driving your decisions to have to sign a contract that you really don't, you shouldn't be signing. You've got a healthier growth rate of investment in offshore energy, which includes wind, than you have on onshore energy. What do you think of the dynamics behind that in the last 12 months? Offshore, well, offshore energy investment growth rate relative to onshore growth rate. Look, look, we're we're bid a tremendous amount into the wind industry in the U.S. Um, the numbers just don't work of what the developers want to see our equipment at. The numbers don't work, uh, but they're not going out and trying to buy our vessels and own their own vessels as well. Uh, so, and they're not making any money. Uh, so that's got to that reaches a point where something's got to give. Uh, they're all going back to their producer contracts and trying to get more subsidies and trying to get a, a, better, uh, a better return for themselves. But uh, the, the days are over that we can subsidize the business, uh, subsidize the market. The end consumer has to pay what he has to pay. We cannot be in a position to subsidize, nor can our customers, uh, the American people or any country, uh, they've got to pay whatever whatever the toll is, and we've got to make a fair return. That's just, that's just that in, in a nutshell. <laughs> and absolutely right. And but but I have seen a real shift in the last year and a half in the movement from onshore to offshore. You know, and and you see it in those customers that have both offerings. It used to be when we would talk to somebody that had both land and an offshore capability, the offshore guys would tell us, oh, we're just not getting any capital. There's just no way I can put anything to work. And that's that's really shifted. You know, all of the capital seems to be moving, incremental capital seems to be moving offshore. And that's a good sign. And and you know, the the watchword of energy security has really become a focus around the world. And as a result, people are making longer term decisions. When people People were making short-term decisions, short-cycle decisions. They were going on land. It, I mean, I don't think anyone truly believed that the the land investments were actually a higher return. They were just more. They were just more. Uh, they were less risk. You know, they, they they had a quicker payoff period, and and people can go ahead and play them and get out fairly quickly. But now that people are more focused on energy security, I, I see them developing facilities and developing offshore installations that they were only contemplating seven years ago. So there's been a real shift in the last year and a half of the capital pushing offshore, and it has a more, and it, it, it's emblematic of a more long-term thinking in the in the EMP companies. You know, we've had a slip in the last 12 months from 120-ish a day down to about 70 bucks a day on West Texas and Brent. Is, is there a number where the offshore stalls a bit? Uh, I think it's got to be below 60. John? Well, I think there's definitely a number which people reconsider, and I, I don't know if it's 60, but I, mean, I think it's also where you're coming from. I mean, 120, pretty much every project is viable. 60 look a lot closer, particularly as costs have come up. You know, I also, you know, we've seen, to Quentin's point, I mean, offshore you've seen basin changing areas for major oil companies like Exxon and Guyana, Total and Namibia. You know, you just don't get those opportunities onshore. It's much more quick cycle, but it's but generally lower volumes and not sustainable volumes. So I think, you know, to back to the break even point, depends which basin. Uh, you're dealing with in like Namibia, Total is going to do their five well exploration program to delineate what they have, even if the price being a little extreme is at 30. Uh, they're not going to do that. They're not going to drill the North Sea at 30. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and then some of the areas that we're seeing the most significant growth in, and it was illustrated a little bit in the earlier presentations, what when you, when you look at the Middle East, they're, they're doing quite fine at $60 an oil, okay? Brazil's not stopping at $60. And so, you know, the Southern Caribbean, Suriname, Guyana, it's not, you know, it's not stopping, you know, even at $60. There's definitely areas that are in the high 60s. Uh, but, you know, the investment decisions that are being made are long-term investment decisions. And the general... Uh, a general view from my perspective is people believe you know, oil and gas to be constrained over the next five to ten years, and so making investments today in a long-term investment is not a problem. So if we go back to Mike's presentation ahead of ours, and we're not going to have enough vessels, what's your biggest fear? 
what creates that opportunity? Does it take lower interest rates? Does it take crazier banks? What does it take to uh, mess up this picture? That's a good question. I mean, from my, my vantage point, um, it's got to be people getting, getting capital at a low price and willing to take a risk. And I don't think there's the institutional knowledge today, there's, there's that capital doesn't seem to be out there in, in any large sum. I think we'll see some people try to build equipment on a ca out of free cash flow uh, just to have a new piece of equipment uh, in an aging fleet. But you're right. I mean, it's, um, I think the, the capacity is going to be, there's going to be more, more demand than there is supply. Uh, and something's got to give. And if, if our customers want us to build new equipment, in my book, they have to sign long, long, long-term contracts that are non-cancelable or have penalties if they cancel. Uh, and they've got to agree to us on what a fair rate or return for the entire project is. And if they don't like uh, the cost of capital that we're getting in the market, they need to come in with their own capital and loan us the money to build the ships. Uh, and get their cost of capital down so that they can get a, a, a better day rate. But without that, uh, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's a tough equation right now. You know, if you, if you go back to the last build cycle that, that, that ended in 2014, you know, what we saw was a, a tremendous amount of building coming out of China, and it was subsidized. And I don't believe that we're going to see that facilitated again. So the you know the 90% of delivery, the 15% discount to, to build prices, that's what we were seeing in Canada at the end of 2014, 2012 to 2014. I don't believe that, I'm sorry, in China in, in that period, I don't believe we're going to see that again. So we're not going to have the state-sponsored phenomenon that we had in the last build cycle. Uh, you know, to Todd's comment, you know, there's, the, the capital has gotten smarter, and which is great, because we need to make sure that, you know, we're you're not overbuilding this industry again. And there's a few factors that I think are going to keep it in check. Uh, and there'll always be some building, so, but, but I don't worry about some building. I, I, wor I worry about the building in scale that we saw from 2012 to 2014. But, the, you know, the, the curves that we saw earlier in, in this, in this in the conference about the rollover in the demand for hydrocarbons in 2030 or 2035, depending on your view. We previously, to, to, to this period, never believed that this was a uh, mature industry that was rolling over. Everyone believed that there was perpetual growth. So building a vessel for 20 to 25 years made common sense. People are not betting on a 20 to 25 year life for these vessels today. So, you know, as excited as we are on current day rates, they're still, from my perspective, you know, 50% of what they should be in order to justify a new build under the traditional terms of having a vessel for a 20 to 25 year life. If you've got a vessel for a 15 year life, or if you're looking at a vessel and you're gonna have to retrofit the engines for a lower engine, lower carbon technology five years from now, there's no economics that makes sense to building a vessel. And so my hope uh, is that the, that, that type of sanity will, will creep into the industry, although the shipping sector is not really full of sane people, so that's a problem. And John, same question. Yeah, and I agree with Quentin. I was going to say, I mean, you're, you're building a long-lived asset for a short cycle or short to medium cycle business, and it, it's, it's hard to match up. And then you add on, like you were talking about the fuel source and what you would build, and it's not evident. You know, you, you certainly wouldn't build a carbon-dependent vessel for the next 25 years. You would build, you know, something that could be retrofitted, changed, modified to build, to burn something that's less carbon intensive. And I, I think that is a new factor that hasn't been here before, is, is the duration of the business. And while well, you can say, you know, it's the business of peak demand, but there'll still be demand, and you know, rust never sleeps, and steel is in the salt water, uh, so you'll have some attrition, it, it does put a break on, on how much you would invest and build for the long term when it's an uncertain future. So I, I seem to run this panel every five years. Uh, five years ago, the mood wasn't great, by the way. Is that your uh, survey cycle? <laughs> ten, <laughs> ten years ago, it, it was better than it should have been. But, you know, I've been dying to ask this question. So what are you going to do with the money? Let's talk about capital allocation. Well, that's a great question. You know, I, I still believe that consolidation at the right prices for the right vessels is the best use of capital for us. 
But quite frankly, you know, this, these businesses, all of our businesses, you know, they, they have such high degree of operating leverage. Once you start seeing day rates move up into these areas that we're talking about, I couldn't deploy all the cash into additional consolidation, right? I mean, I have to return it to shareholders, and I'm very glad to do that. So it'll be a form of dividends or share repurchases or the like. But you know, my first tier of investments is sensible acquisitions that help us maintain the, you know, the longevity of the earnings capacity of the fleet. Uh, I've got 235 vessels. I don't need any more but I can make a hell of a lot more money with a hell of a lot more vessels, so I'll look to do that. But they've got to be done at the right price, and they've got to be done for the right vessels. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's just look at it. You know, we're all getting into this uh, belief that we've got to return capital to shareholders, right? And I, and I agree with that. I mean, we need to, we need to do that. But first and foremost, uh, we're in a part of the cycle that we're still in the consolidating phase. We need to do that first. The second, part of the, the second part of the growth is getting the earnings up to where a free cash flow is sustainable, have low amount of debt. I think one turn of debt is probably where everybody wants to see these service companies today. Um, and then we've got to look at, it's a volatile industry. So when you're returning capital, you've got to have a minimum liquidity uh, on your balance sheet to deal with the volatility, uh, where we would say before, uh, keep enough to do two or three uh, payments or two or three, um, say, a year, a year and a half of uh, capital to pay your interest and your principal, if you have that, or, or however your capital structure is, is one thing. But we also have to have another set of capital set aside before we start paying dividends that deals with a true downturn uh, because there's a lot of other friction costs besides your debt capital, <laughs> a lot. Um, and uh, stacking costs, it's letting crews go and, and, and pensions and, and union uh, uh, payoffs and all these things that are huge uh, cost uh, to a business and you've got to ha have that in place as well and then I think the service industry can start paying a dividend beyond that. Uh, and I think you, if you don't have another use of that capital to grow your business for a fair return at a fair risk, uh, then you return it back to the shareholders. Well, I think I put in the category, of, I won't count my chickens in, until they hatch. Uh, so first, got to generate the cash. Um, unlike others, you but know. You, once you get those chickens, what are you going to do with them? Well, <laughs> I'm cautious enough. We've been through enough. I, I'll look at the chickens first. Uh, <laughs> you know, we also, we didn't go bankrupt, so we do have some debt to service from D&B and others. So uh, I'm sure they'll have their hands out. And then I, I think, yeah, it is, uh, you know, return to shareholders. And I do think, you know, there, while there's a limited life or you can foresee a limited life for oil and gas, there certainly is a lim limited life, there isn't a limited life for offshore energy services, whether that's wind, whether that's solar, whether that's carbon capture. So I think it's really looking at, you know, what you would build or what that service model would look like and what you might potentially build to service those new types. And, and I think generally that would probably be a, a cheaper per unit asset uh, because it'd be less sophisticated, uh, generally be shallower water. Um, but I think you know, you, you're going to be looking at what would be, assuming there's the offshore environment is still used for energy production of multiple forms, what will be needed to service it? OK, let's take it down the home stretch now. To, Quentin, to the extent that you can, give us your market outlook. You may have to stay with your prior guidance, but give us your market outlook. <laughs> oh, I have no problem staying with my prior guidance. I mean, you know, I, the, the supply and demand of vessels and the pricing for vessels is not affecting any EMP company's investment decision. Okay, you know, we, we could double the price of vessels and it's not going to have an impact on whether somebody goes FID on a project. Right? That's just full stop. And, and, and they certainly could have paid full price during the downturn. So it's really about the supply and demand balance that allows us to drive price. And there's nothing about the supply and demand uh, balance today that tells me it's going to get anything but tighter. Vessels are going to continue to attrition. You know, activity levels, whether it's construction for pipeline, whether it's offshore wind, whether it's basic production, whether it's plug and abandon, whether it's drilling activity, all of that is increasing. And so you've got the steady increasing in demand and steady decrease in supply and nothing in the order book. So we should be able to continue to push price 
you know, for, for a fleet of 235 vessels, we'll, we'll probably push it about $3,000 year over year, which is a big increase for us. You know, uh, you know that's about $250 million worth of uh, EBITDA. And I, I see the same thing uh, in 24, and I don't see anything stopping in 25. John, let me go to you next. I think I'm bullish on the outlook uh, with all the demand that we have from uh, the other markets, wind and, and military and research and uh, just the natural demand in the oil field. And plus with, uh, with uh, the lack of capital and the new build cost, uh, which is going to be high barriers to entry for anybody to enter. Um, but the service companies need to take a page out of our customers. Uh, we are in the same business as our customers. We're in the same industry. And, and, and our customers, when the price of oil is at $150 a barrel, they don't sell it for 90. They don't sell it for 60 because they say, oh, we're making enough money. The service industry needs to understand that in, in a volatile business that it's the market, it's supply and demand. So if we can get $100,000 a day for our equipment, that's what we need to be getting. We need to adapt ourselves the same way our customers, it's supply and demand. Uh, because that's the business we're in and it's a volatile business and, and you just need to understand that it's not about, uh, it's, it's just business, the way they tell us. <laughs> well, I think related, related to that is the, the challenge I think is there's gonna be increasing pressure from the customer side for longer term charters. They're gonna try and lock up before, they, before even further increases in day rates try and lock up on terms that have cancellation provisions or give them some wiggle room. Uh, and I think, you know, our challenge will be to, to really stick to the contract terms and, you know, I agree, agree, I believe in the fundamentals to put that in practice by staying short on the chartering side because I don't think there's any advantage between increasing demand, continuing cost pressures to lock in long term now. You have a scarce asset that is still underpriced. So five years from now, Quinton, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about? Uh, we are going to His talk retirement about plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got at least ten years. You got ten? <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, no, I think we're going to be talking a little bit about the same thing, right? I think we're going to talk about the rollover in the hydrocarbon demand curve. I think we're going to talk about the growth of wind, right? We're going to be talking more and more about floating offshore wind. Um, and so I think that we're going to see a, you know, a real exciting industry. This industry is going to morph. You know, the nice thing about this particular industry is that unlike a lot of oil service industries, we have the natural segue into renewables. You know, you don't see that with a lot of oil field service companies. And I'm, and I'm very confident in our ability to capitalize on it. It's what we do on a regular basis. So I think we'll be talking more about offshore wind. I think we'll be talking a lot more about floating wind. And I think we'll talk about plug and abandon as well. And Todd, you're going to be talking about ESG, right? <laughs> yes. yes. We've got to talk about all of it. But I think, uh, I think as uh, the, in, in the next five years, we're going to see a lot of twists and turns. You know, I don't think the wind industry is going to play out like everybody thinks. I think there's going to be a lot of twists and turns there. Uh, there's going to be hiccups, just like when we built out deep water for the last you know, 25, uh, 26, 27 years now, there's been a lot of twists and turns. We learned a lot, costs were different, uh, economies shift, uh, and, and so it's gonna, be, it's gonna be volatile, I think, like the, like, like the, uh, uh, like the business we're in today, uh, because it's, it, it is very capital intensive, uh, and it's very expensive and very hard to do and very hard to maintain. Uh, so I think it's gonna, it's gonna be volatile. It already has been in the U.S. Projects have delayed how many times? And we keep seeing them get, getting delayed. Uh, but I'm excited. I think I'm, I'm a bull because we're all going to still burn energy. And the population's not waning. It's waxing. So I think we're in, we're in, in a very good spot. And I agree with Quentin that, that uh, our assets is easily moved over uh, to support a lot of different other industries. So I think the vessel companies are a better risk profile uh, to invest in uh, than a lot of the other oil field service companies because we just can't just drill a well. We can do a lot of different things. Uh, and, and as our fleets grow, if two or three vessels go down or, 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 or we don't have, or we lose five or six contracts, you're never gonna know it on an earnings basis. So our risk is really, really spread out and I think it's a better place to invest into. 
And John, in, 30, in 28 seconds, what are we going to be talking about in five years? <laughs> We're probably going to talk about day rates and utilization. <laughs> we always talk about the market. Always. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I think the, they are very flexible assets, and I think they will be used differently. And, uh, but we'll still be talking about the day rates and utilization for whatever we're doing.